So I'm Cliff Click. I've been writing uh, code for uh, 40 odd years. Um, if you do the math, it says I wrote my first compiler when I was 15. Uh, distributed computation shortly thereafter, including a pile of Z80 machines. If anyone remember, remembers what a Z80 is, I'd worked on a parallel Z80 mob. Um, device drivers, operating systems. And, and the thing I'm probably most well known for is, is uh, the hotspot server compiler, which I had a huge amount of pushback from everyone at the time that you couldn't do a heavyweight compiler in a jitted scenario. And it basically showed the world that, in fact, you could do all kinds of amazing optimizations. And it kind of changed how people think about virtual machines. Um, so you know, along the way of the journey of Hotspot, um, lots and lots and lots of things happened for which I ended up making choices that, at that time, um, sometimes I didn't even realize I was making a choice, that I had a choice. Uh, it was all new to everybody that you could get a, a virtual machine that would be so performant. And you know, we were just making our best shots at the time with the knowledge we had available. And in hindsight, looking backwards, I can say there are a lot of interesting decisions made, some of which sucked uh, and led to serious problems that required sort of massive engineering overhaul efforts to fix uh, later, but were required to go to the next level of performance. So you know, I've been working on Hotspot for about 20 years, you know, 10 at Sun and 10 more at Azul. Um, I watched Hotspot become thread robust. So I mean, thread robust means um, works well with thousands of runnable threads and thousands of threads blocked on I.O. and thread churn rates at you know, hundreds of new threads a second kinds of things. So that's hard to make that work right. Uh, I, I worked on porting Hotspot to um, all those platforms, including you know, doing all kinds of machine code generation for them all. Uh, I worked on the different compilers, mostly C2, but definitely on the interfaces between C1 and C2 and the shared runtime. Uh, I worked with people who did all kinds of GC algorithms. I don't know if anyone here remembers the train algorithm, um, but these were all GCs, and there were several more that I was part of that were being put into Hotspot or attempted to be put into Hotspot. Uh, the last one there was done at Azul, and that's um, interesting in that it, it brings pause times down to the low microsecond range, the max pause down to the low microsecond range. So not average pause, but the max pause. So that, that's actually pretty impressive. And these are on heaps that are hundreds of gigabytes doing tens of gigabytes of second allocation rates on a stock x86. So it's the nature of this talk that I have too much stuff. And you're looking at 20 years of history, I'm going to compress into 40 minutes. I can't do it. So um, there's lots of interesting things here. There's lots of interesting, weird interlocks between the different kind of design decisions and how, how much trouble they cause you down the road, at, at, you know, what your limits of performance are going to be. So I'm going to just have to breeze through, just out of time. Uh, and that, in turn, means uh, feel free to stop me and ask questions, because if, if you don't get it, somebody else doesn't either. So ask questions. Um, and, and I'm all good with taking the you know, interrupts in the middle of the talk. So uh, I'll whip through the agenda here real quick. I'm going to talk about some interesting choices that maybe you don't realize that if you're a VM writer that you've already made, or that you had a choice at the time you made it. Um, and then we'll look into native calls, which and, and you know, and, and the first blush, you think, oh, I'm going to call some native code. It's going to do some like stupid blaz sack speed. It's going to add to arrays together or something, whatever. It's easy, right? So there shouldn't be any trouble at all. It turns out to be a giant pain in the neck um, for reasons that are not obvious. And then I'll talk about some things that worked out really well that in, you know, at the time we made the decision, we're just like a crapshoot. Uh, you roll the dice and, oh, hey, that worked out. Um, some things that we tried that we knew were hard, that we spent a lot of effort at, but were worth doing. And ultimately, some things that were just complete fails that I'll never, ever do again. Um, and then I'll just run out of time, and that's all we can do. So um, virtual machines are sort of big, complex beasties, or maybe they're not. You know, maybe they're tiny, tiny little things like Squawk and OVM from a few years ago. Kind of depends on your feature set, and the features that you pick interact in various bad ways that are usually not obvious at the time you start. I went the big desktop server route, um, but at that time, there are a lot of people making virtual machines for tiny cell phones. And you know, when I say tiny cell phones, these are cell phones with less than a gig. OK, so these days, cell phones are actually pretty big. And maybe you want to have a big, complicated VM on your cell phone. Maybe not. It's a different set of problems. Certainly, if you're looking for like JavaScript on an embedded device that's going to go in like a car or, or some really tiny thing, um, you can go down a completely set of different choices, and you get a much simpler VM. But if you're going to go to a place where you're going to run sort of arbitrary code, sort of native code that's not trustable, that doesn't play nice with a virtual machine, you have a lot of interesting problems that have to be solved um, that make your VM complicated. OK, so here's a pile of choices. I'm just going to throw them out without saying which one's better, which one's not. Um, how portable do you want your VM to be? You're going to run on x86 only ever? That's probably a good choice. Maybe you want to run on ARM, right? Um, you have indianness issues. 
you have calling conventions? Are you going to use, whose compiler are you using for doing the non-VM piece versus your jitted code piece, right? Are you using the standard C compiler using one of the different, on x86, there's like five different API calling conventions you can pick from? You, are your threads green threads? Roll your own, the POSIX threads? How are your stacks laid out? That's a crucial game to be played there. Which way, not just which way they grow, but how do they grow and how do you handle stack overflow issues? Um, you're looking at, you know, GPUs, DSP chips, ARMs, or just x86. You're gonna have an interpreter, you're gonna have a JIT, you're gonna have both. Um, you can get away with all or none of the above, right? Are, you, are your threads cooperative? Are they, uh, you're gonna have a preemptive OS. If you have a preemptive OS, it interacts badly with GC in weird ways. You have cooperative, it doesn't. So it makes a big difference. You have multi-CPU, not just multi-threaded, but multi-CPU. You have multi-CPU, you have to have atomic instructions. You have to JIT, you have to generate atomic instructions. You have to have a way to define atomic instructions that are accessible from the language that your virtual machine's running to produce an atomic, you know, compare and swap instruction. So it's not an obvious translation layer there. So here's an interpreter, some choices, right? How do you write an interpreter? Well, it's pretty easy. You sit down with your C code, and you grab this array of bytes, and you read a byte code, and you do it. You read a byte code, and you do it. You're like, oh, okay, fine. Your pure C interpreter is easy, right? Turns out that most of your time is spent in dispatch, so you can speed it up by using GCC label vars, for instance. It's not almost pure C, so you lose some portability, but it's still, it's, it's like double the speed. You go to pure assembly, I got double speed again. Um, I got fancier yet for weird dispatch logic for variable size byte codes. Um, to get more speed out yet out of your interpreter. You know, it, it, it's you, doubling in the interpreter is worth something there. You know, it's, it's useful. Um, what's your layout of your interpreter? Is it a stack based? Is it register based? If it's stack based, it typically interoperates very badly with jitted code. And then you have a horrible problem having your interpreter call jitted code and the jitted code called back into the interpreter. And so you have to make some decisions about how your interpreter like, looks like. Okay, let's talk about jits. Right? Do you have none? Makes life a lot easier, it's much simpler. Um, but maybe you want to have some more performance, and so like a stage zero, template style JIT. Just read a bytecode, slap some instructions out. Read a bytecode, slap instructions. So that one is very quick to generate code. The code quality is really sucky, um, and, you, and it's very bulky. On the other hand, you get the calling convention of your choice for how you want to JIT code, and so that kind of JIT can intercall with a better JIT sort of freely. Um, if instead you decide you want just uh, a, you know, a, a heavier weight JIT, you're going to have to do something with how you intercall with uh, interpreted code. Uh, in both cases, you're going to have to look at how you're intercalling with the native code. Um, you know, suppose you're, you're looking at like graphics routines for scribbling on your screen. What's the API for calling those graphics routines? It's probably fixed by the C compiler on that hardware, on that platform. Okay, is that a good calling convention? Most C compilers support var args. Var args demands all your, all your arguments be passed in registers in the same like, integer register file because you don't know what's a float and what's a int register when you call printf. Well, if you're looking at Java and it's all strongly typed in the calling args, you do know. And maybe you want to pass your floats and float registers and not on the int registers. So if you're intercalling native code, you have to shuffle the DOM floats around from the float to the int and back and forth as a screw up. So, so it's a pain in the neck and you have to think about you know, whose calling convention you're going to deal with. Um, class loading versus inlining, like non-final methods. Like in, in the land of C, all methods are final, right? In C++, almost everything's final, like Java is final, because you have to say virtual as a keyword. You go to Java, you don't say virtual, you don't say final, I'm sorry, uh, it's, it's, it's a virtual call. But almost never overridden, actually. And so most non-final calls are actually final in practice, but not in theory. And so when you go JIT them, you want to inline, and that's the key optimization by when all these guys, when you get a JITed code, inlining is the key optimization. You want to inline the non-finals if, in fact, later you're wrong and you load a class and the class overrides that final, that non-final method that you inlined, you have to undo the inlining. And then that, in turn, directly drives the code quality you can get around that call site. And there's some serious choices to make there that are sort of non-obvious. Hotspot went the high performance route. No one else on the planet that I know of has done so. And I'm happy to talk to people who think otherwise. Um, and it directly impacts uh, uh, final code quality, top peak performance, as well as all kinds of stuff around how you de-opt and unwind from things. Um, I I think I managed a lot of this except mentioning the stuff at the bottom here. Um, template style JITs, they're fast, but they're not as fast as, as interpreting run once code. The cost to spray out a bunch of bytes of, of data that are going to be instructions and then 
swap them from the dcache to the iCache and then execute them is still slower than having an interpreter, which is all hot in your iCache, reading one byte and doing the work and the reading the next byte and doing the work. So it's clearly slower at startup and run once code to have a stage zero jet uh, instead of an interpreter. But the trade-off then is you have to intercall between interpreted code, which typically has some horrible stack layout, versus you know jitted code, which wants to pass everything in registers. Okay, GC, do you have it at all? Do you do ref counting? Do you have a simple one? Like it's easy to get started with a stop the world, run one one generation everything through at once. But maybe you want a faster one. You got a multi-core machine. You got multiple threads producing garbage in parallel. You better clean it up in parallel. You're going to spend all your time doing GC in one thread, right? So you want a, a, a high throughput. What does fast mean? Does it mean low pause? Uh, maybe you want interactivity. So how do you get a low pause collector going? You know, and when do you do it in the life of building your system? Do you want an exact uh, garbage collector versus conservative? You know, conservative lets you intercall in the native code without thinking about it. You got a bunch of C routines for doing all your bit blitting, screen scribbling stuff for doing blahs and Fortran routines for God only knows what. Um, you have to track the pointers because you're going to move them in a moving collector. How do you track them in the C code? C compiler's not tracking them. So you go to a conservative collector and you don't move them. It's a lot easier, but it's also definitely lower performance. An exact collector um, by default will continuously compact the active heap. And that in turn gives you better cache layout and it, it shows up in fewer cache misses all throughout the code, and it's something like 5 to 10% faster than a non-moving collector, it, it just on the better cache behavior. So there's a clear performance gain to have an exact moving collector um, at an expense of a lot of tracking of what's uh, an object pointer and what's not. Um, how about you know picking new algorithms? How much engineering dollars are you going to spend coding up a fancy new algorithm? Um, do you want to be parallel? As I mentioned, you got multiple cores producing garbage in parallel. You probably want to collect in parallel or you're going to start to suck on GC times, right? Concurrent is actually really, really hard to do. If you want to have you know, low pause, you want to do most of your collections while some other threads are running and trying to keep up with their frame rate. And if you do parallel and concurrent, then it becomes much, much harder to do. So the, these are long tail, big engineering efforts. Um, more GC choices here. Stop anywhere versus safe points. What do we mean here? So stop anywhere says, I have some thread and it's running, and I have some other thread who just did an allocation and the heap ran out and needs more. Start a GC cycle. <clears throat> on the running thread, do I stop it and do a GC cycle right now? Where did it stop? It stopped on some random instruction. I told the OS, hey, stop this guy. I'm going to move all his pointers. Well, I'll find all his pointers. Well, where did he stop? He stopped some junky place. Where are all his pointers hidden? So you probably have a map saying, oh, I hid the pointers here and here and here and here in these registers, except the map gets way too bulky. You can't have it for every possible place he stops. So you have the maps occasionally, and then how do you look at where he's at and where you have a map, and you roll forward the map, uh, sort of interpret them, or you know, how do you find what's, uh, where the pointers are? There, there are some games you can do here, like declare pointers are only in even registers and even stack slots, and non-pointers on odd registers and odd stack slots. Th there's a bunch of interesting choices there. Uh, safe points are different. Uh, path to go, which says I'm only going to stop a, a running thread at a safe point, whatever that is, and it's a place where I do have a map, and I have to have the thread only at these places when I do a GC, uh, and that means I have to roll it forward if it got preempted at the wrong place. Um, so I badly want people to preempt only at safe points, so if they have thousands of runnable threads, and I stop to take a GC cycle, of which you know my 32 core machine, 32 guys are actually running, and 1,000 were not, but the 1,000 were not. We're all at a safe point already, and so I don't have to do anything about it. I can just go read their stacks and do stuff. Um, turns out you can pull in software to run safe points. That was not known to us. And the original hotspot implementation did safe points, but with a different mechanism than software pulling. That sucked really badly. I'll talk about it later. Um, threading issues. So, if you don't have any threads because you're running a little tiny device, um, you can get away with all kinds of stuff. As soon as you have threads, even on one core, uh, not all your operations are atomic. And so you can be preempted inconveniently and you need locking. Okay? Um, you didn't need it before, now you do. You have to go find all the places in your code where you have to insert locks that you didn't realize you did, and you leave this long bug tail where you find all the missing locks, right? It also turns out that um, you know, garbage collection wants your stack pointer and your program counter to discover all your stack roots. Uh, okay, fine. Um, go ask the OS, please. Mr. OS, tell me, I'm the GC thread over here. Go tell me that thread's stack pointer. Well, the answer is the OS lies on low frequency rare. And, and when it lies, you get a crap program counter back or a crap SP back. 
And that means you don't walk those stack routes correctly, and you garbage collecting something that's live, and the program crashes with low frequency way down the line much later when you fall over the, the missing guy. So this is very surprising to me, except I kept finding these crashes um, on every OS I tried it on, and I tried it on a lot. Um, the fix eventually was I gave it up, and now whenever I do you know, VM implementation of DC, it's I'm going to record the program counter and the stack pointer in user mode and not rely on the OS at all for this information. It's available, the OS will give it to me, but the OS doesn't actually give it to me. It gives me something close most of the time, right? And that's the problem, of course. If it gave you something fail all the time, we'd fix the bug. Um, okay. As soon as I go to multi-core, which these days is everywhere, um, now you need atomic operations. You didn't need them before. You could do locks without atomics when you only had one core, but now you have to have atomic operations, and you have to have some sort of coherency and memory model uh, going on, so you know how threads talk to each other. When do loads and stores actually communicate through the processor fabric? Um, getting that wrong leads to these low-frequency data race bugs that are just terrible hard to track down. You need locks, but you need not just locks, but scalable locks. When a thousand threads pile up on some lock, you better be very, very efficient and very, very uh, and fair. You must be fair. It's all great to say, hey, the spec doesn't demand fairness. In practice, every large you know, web server style app in Java will crash and burn if you don't have fair locks that can handle thousands of runnable threads. It just has to be there. So that means to get efficiency out, you have all kind of games you have to do on the locks. So you have staggered, staged lock acquire mechanisms where you first try the cheapest possible thing. You had it speculatively already. Then you try CAS instruction, and that fails. You do some spinning for a while, and then that fails. You want to block, and then you want to block in a way that goes to fairness, and then some sort of queuing mechanism. And the OS doesn't provide fair locks. None of the OSs, uh, I think right now, well, maybe. Maybe I can get some on some of the OSs now. Typically, I don't get fair locks out of the OS. I have to have them, or, the, or the, these web servers will all die in horrible ways. So you're implementing fair locks in user land. Right? Um, also, of course, you woke up from some long blocked operation, um, like you're waiting for a disk read to come back, and the thread pops up and one starts running, but GC's in progress, and the running thread's got GC pointers that were on a stack that he immediately loads and registers and begins screwing with, and you crash and burn because you're moving a pointer you're using. So you have to take a, some sort of GC lock when you wake up. Um, There's it's a bunch of interesting kind of locking games going on there. Okay, here's a stupid one. 64-bit um, math. Uh, the original hotspot did it as on a 32-bit machine with a pair of ints, a high and a low, and you had an add and add with carry. And it turns out the major user of long math was Big Integer, which was crypto and web services. Well, Big Integer uses a, actually as like a pair of ints with a carry between them, and you would shift one or the other by 32 bits, or you'd mask one off or the other, you'd store the high or the low, and that optimizes really well as a pair of ints. Um, in fact, so much well that getting 64-bit ops for doing uh, long math didn't actually help. Um, in, in many cases, you're better off doing this than actually using a 64-bit integer math op. It's kind of like, who the hell thought that? Okay. So any, any questions on that before I go to, to <laughs> round two? All right. Okay, so this is a native call. So uh, you know, imagine I got a call here. This is going to take a this pointer and a double. It's going to return me some sort of object. Um, uh, you know, maybe it's like uh, uh, taking some sort of double of some sort of offset to give me a bit blip behavior or whatever. You know, I'm, I'm screwing around with something that's going to touch hardware, so there is a native call involved. Uh, and I'm calling from Java in this case, but it could be almost any virtual managed language. I'm going to show this in Spark, but all these issues arise on x86. And, and I'm, I'm just certain they arise on ARM, and I know the, they arise on Itanium and Azul and, and whatever other platforms it did already. Um, so what you'd like to believe is I'm going to do some sort of uh, create a stack frame for this local call. Um, that's the save 64. I'm going to do maybe an argument shuffle to get it from one uh, argument to another, register to another, make my call, and return results, and I'm done. So these are all, you know, uh, you know dual quad issue, one clock a pop. This is like two clocks. Right, this is all fast, ah, boom, ah, native call cheap. Well, almost. So actually, um, because of C calling convention loves to have floats in the int registers because of var args, um, the register's in the wrong place. So I have to move it from the floating point register to the int registers, and I'm showing, unfortunately, 32-bit Spark, um, which probably isn't appropriate anymore. Uh, but that would cause you to have to load uh, two halves of a double into two different registers because you're misaligned because the 
register zero is holding the this pointer. Um, so you have to shuffle some registers around. In general, you have an arbitrary register-register uh, register shuffle game that has to happen, including stack location layout. Okay, next, can't pass, oops, object-oriented pointers, GCable pointers in the native code, because what the hell is a native code do with it. He doesn't tell you what he does with it. And if you have your collector and he moves the thing and the native code uses the old unmoved pointer and you crash and burn. So you have to not hand him uh, pointers. Now this isn't true if you can trust your native code. If you wrote all that native code yourself and you know what the hell it does, you can get away with not playing these handleizing games. But if it's arbitrary, some third party library, you know what the hell, where it came from, um, you must hide those oops. It didn't occur to me. Um, oh, Mario's going to jump up and say something here now. You, you're agreeing with him, or, or you have something else? I'm sorry? Mike, Mike. But back when we did the exact VM at some labs, we had this dichotomy because the Java 1.0 and 1.1 use conservative collection. Ole Eerson wrote a 10-line program which clearly had no significant live data but always ran out of memory because the ints looked like pointers. It's the worst possible scenario in a shipping VM is to have the CEO of some big company call you and say, we're out of memory and we don't know why. Uh, I'm sure you could. I'm sure you can make one. So WebKit, WebKit has guaranteed more a larger user base than the exact VM ever did. So Web, WebKit guaranteed ha has a larger user base than the exact VM ever did. We did have bugs where you would run out of memory. But we fix those bugs by just making sure that we sanitize the stack at the appropriate points. There's various hacks that you can do. OK, so, so, so let's, let's take this offline and compare notes, because I'm wondering what your cost to, to play your sanitization games, as well as the, the lost memory for the conservative pieces there, stacks up against the, the cost of dealing with this. The, the engineering cost, the ex execution runtime cost here is actually pretty modest. So the engineering cost to fix it once you discovered it was wrong after the fact was a, you know, was a big pain in the neck. So, so, so this is maybe foreshadowing for my talk, but uh, th absolutely, this is definitely th there's the thing for <laughs> absolutely. Well, I'll, I'll be happy to be sit in your talk, and and we'll we'll have it out. <laughs> um, okay, so all I'm doing here is I'm going to handleize to allow me to have a moving uh, collector on the stack. I'm going to move stack pointers. One, one uh, more, th one more thing about this slide in particular. Um, sorry. Uh, so regarding the uh, the oops here. Uh, any opinions on object pinning? I know Hotspot didn't support it, but uh, it it, uh, it uh, um, was too constrictive for the kinds of garbage collectors that you wanted to have. So we looked at object pinning, and Hotspot came and went on object pinning. It, there was definitely times when it was in, definitely times when it was out. Um, it definitely constrains the kind of GCs. So as I mentioned earlier, Hotspot's gone through like six or seven different GCs, um, some of which could support pinning, some of which could not. Um, the, the more high performant GCs definitely did not want to screw around with object pinning. One more? One more, okay. But. All right, so while we're throwing rocks at Cliff, uh, all this handleization thing basically is because we're writing all our VMs in unsafe languages. Should we stop doing that? I, that <laughs> So, so my, my summary slide says, yes, we should stop. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll agree. <laughs> I'll also say that there are some interesting problems in doing that, but that's a different talk. Um, OK, so I'm going to handle ice. Is that it? We're ready to roll? Have we, everyone read this slide five times over and know what it's doing? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just skip and go. You, you have to dehandleize on exit, too, as well as handleize going in. OK. Um, synchronized native calls need a lock. Um, I'm just going to show quickie. I'll talk through this fast here. Um, thin locks, so you're, you're setting a bit in object header because um, it's Java and all objects can be locked. 
Um, in a fail mode, including like failing recursive locks, you have to do something else that could be relatively modest if it's just a recursive lock you're taking. Could be highly expensive if you're about to block because you're going to go to the OS and block. Um, unlock also has a slow path because you have to wake up some other thread who's waiting desperately to get the same lock that you're holding. Stack crawl. So I mentioned earlier, uh, OS's lie, don't rely on them. So I store the PC and the uh, stack pointer down right before I go, and I store it down into some sort of thread local storage area. So that's G7 on a Spark. On the x86s, I ended up doing uh, uh, lining the stacks on two meg boundaries, and then you could mask off bits and give you some space that was thread local uh, at very low cost. So. There's a way to get at your thread local storage. You're going to do it a lot. You want to have some cheap way to get at it. It better be cheap on the order of like a handful of clock cycles cheap. Um, and in this case, then I jam down some bits. And this instruction, the store at the bottom there of you know stack pointer down, that is an unlock to the GC. So in the very next clock cycle, GC has moved pointers. So you just have to be aware that that's the timing on that guy. Um, same story in reverse. When you come out, uh, GC is in progress, perhaps. So when you grab your thread local storage word that had your, you know, your bit saying, I, I took the lock, you have to CAS to untake it because you're fighting the GC who's also locked you. So there's an interesting notion of a distributed lock which says if a thread, any thread owns the GC lock, he can mutate the heap and the GC cannot. And vice versa, when all threads have released the GC lock, the GC can take it and then he can mangle the heap at his whim. Um, that notion turned out to work out really well uh, in, in, uh, in all the places I've used it um, and turned out to be not nearly as egregious as it maybe it sounds to both maintain and make it, make it work right. Uh, it was cheap to do and fairly cheap to implement and easy to debug and diagnose and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so putting that together, uh, oh, I know, okay, so Java includes a Java environment, which is someplace in thread local storage. Uh, it was thrown in as an extra argument to all native calls for whatever reason. There's some more support for temp handles um, resetting them so that the native code can make and screw around with a bunch of handles that you're going to throw away right at the end. And you end up with something that looks like this, of which all this crap, you know, I can say it does require on an x86, although we can, you know, talk about the GC handleizing game. Um, here's some handleization game. Here's a standard, you know, stack slot. Here's the JNIM. Here's argument shuffle because your arguments that you jitted to probably were not what, you know, you wanted the C compiler is going to jit to. Here's your GC lock enabling your stack crawl, the actual call, unwind the GC lock, dehandleize any result, arg shuffle the return result, and you're out. A bunch of, bunch of, bunch of stuff there. Okay. So that was, that was just that fun dive into some horrible place. <laughs> okay. So now I'm going to talk about things that, uh, that in hindsight worked out really well. Safe points being the, the major one. Um, it was easy for the server compiler to track safe points to allow DOPS at safe points only um, and to optimize them. And that in turn led to really good optimization. Uh, the number of times where you had to carry along extra state in the generated code so that you could unwind for debuggability for uh, class loading, you know, deoptimization was rare and picked by the compiler. So rare meant you had to have one on every possible path. So all loops had to have one somewhere. Um, but the compiler could pick where. And that, in turn, let him do a lot of good optimization, and it made it very, very cheap to do. So this is a notion that works out well in practice for getting you know, fast, good performance out of stuff. Uh, when you do stop at a safe point, um, you can ask a thread to do many self-service tasks. And that's also crucial. In particular, all of a thread's stacks are all hot in his own caches. So if you want to crawl your stack for GC roots and maybe flip them, do a GC phase flip, do collect unmarked roots or whatever the hell, um, a thread does it on his own. You, you, you tell him at a safe point, he pulls, he comes up with a word saying, hey, it's not zero, do something. He checks, there's some bits, says crawl my stack and collect the roots. He crawls his own stack, it's all hot, it's L1, it's all L1 cache hits, bam, 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 bam. He's done in microseconds. He puts those things down somewhere and he's back running. So, so the, the, the notion of safe points here enables a lot of good stuff out of threads. Um, I'll talk more about the kind of fun stuff we do at safe points that are all like thread self-service tasks. Um, Software pulling, I grab a bit in my, my thread local storage. Move stack pointer to junk register, mass low bits, test and branch. It's a cache hitting load. It's a predictable branch. It's one clock on an x86, cheap. This one requires some OS support, cooperative prevention, preemption. Worth it if you're doing a low pause GC. You got a thousand runnable threads. You stop a random thread. It's not at a safe point. You can't crawl a stack. You 
can't mutate his stack moves pointers. So instead, you ask him to stop at a safe point, and you want the OS to say, your, your time slice, your quanta is running out. Come to a safe point the next microsecond, or I'll preempt you the hard way. And then the OS, and then the, you, you just set the bid on the thread stack, and you let the guy run, and he preempts himself uh, at, a, at a safe point. So that one turned out to work out really well and lets you handle the very large thread counts um, where everyone is basically always stopped at a safe point. Okay, heavyweight JIT compiler. Um, certainly at the time I did this, I got amazing amounts of pushback that it can't be done, and it turned out that you can, and it works out great. Um, and you get really good peak performance out, including uh, heavyweight loop optimizations like loop and rolling and peeling um, and variant code motion. Uh, range check elimination was done by uh, pre and post loop generation, where the pre and the post loop handled the odd bits of the edge cases, and the main body would have no range checks, and then could be unrolled, perhaps repeatedly, you know, quite large, um, and, and you get sort of Fortran level performance out of your jitted Java code. Um, most of these transformations are actually really cheap. Um, C2's graph IR, C of nodes, another non-traditional choice that worked out well in hindsight. Um, it's very easy to teach people how it works. It's a graph reduction. It's sort of very simple semantically. Um, we could bring a new engineers in, explain how the damn thing worked. They would all pick it up within a day or two and immediately become productive in messing around with the graph IR. It was, it was a really a great way to go. The graph calling allocator, I'll claim, is one of those things that was uh, hard to do and to do right and worth it. Um, the particularly good thing is that I could get the generated code to be robust in the face of over inlining versus spill code. So the problem here, and I'll talk about more later on, is that most allocators suffer the problem that once they begin spilling, they start to spill a lot. And so there's this knee in the performance curve where you inline a little bit and it's better, and you inline a little bit, it's better, and you inline a little bit more, and you've got too many live things, and you start to spill, and one good spill deserves another, and pretty soon it's all spill code. And then, and then performance like falls off hard. And so getting yourself robust in the face of over inlining means you can get away from having to fine tune the inlining edge. It doesn't matter so much. So you can inline a lot, and if you inline too much occasionally, no big deal. And that was one of the key performance benefits of, of a better allocator. You know, better allocation technology. Um, portable stack manipulation. At the time I did it, um, I, I actually didn't start the notion. It was done by other people at, at uh, Hotspot, but it, it worked out really well. Um, and it's just, you can have this notion of, uh, I have a stack to crawl. It has a frame and a next frame. And I can move with an iterator, a classic Java-style iterator. And it works for this wide range of CPUs and OSs of you know, iterating over frames and then having names for the, all the locations on the stack frame that are interesting, including where you spilled everything so you can find the pointers and stuff like that. Um, uh, it actually also worked well with, with various pieces of hardware with hardware registers, hardware stacks. Um, both Itanium and Azul have hardware stacks that needed some kind of flushing and tracking and lazy flushing and whatever hell. Um, that was all straightforward to move into the iterator. Um, Separately, frame adapters versus adapter frames, I'll talk about that, but it's a, uh, there's a really cheap way to reorganize uh, your calling convention args, and it's crucial to do it cheap because you're gonna end up doing it a lot, um, and it's basically you're emitting custom ASM bits for just doing the giant register shuffle. Um, I'll talk a little bit more of that at some point here. Um, so far, we haven't needed more than four gigabytes of jitted cut. I don't know how big your program is, it's much, much bigger. But the amount of hot code that you want to JIT has seemed to sell well below four gigs in all the, the st systems I've worked on. And that means I can get away with a 32-bit program counter. And that means that I can use the cheap local call on all the hardware platforms out there that have a 32-bit fixed static call site uh, instruction. Um, big savings on an x86 for sure, but also on all the other chips. Um, you really want to live with a 32-bit PC and, and think your way through it that way. And then this one, blah, blah, blah a lot, flags. Um, you know, I'll have to blame Dave Unger for this. Um, you get all these fast, slow path games. You have something in the VM that's uh, you know, some abstract high-level concept that mostly you can do really cheap, but you have some slow path where you have to do some horrible thing. You know, classic one's GC where you have to like, you know, mock the whole heap and do a GC cycle versus a new, which is a bump pointer, right? So there's some fast, slow path. And the question is, did you do it right? So how do you diagnose that? Well, the slow path by its nature, by your design, is rare. 
you know, if your slow path is common, then you're just slow. So you're going to be fast, so you, the slow paths are rare, and therefore it never executes, and therefore it's hard to debug it. It's hard to diagnose, it's hard to QA it. So force it. Make it happen all the time. And then you run giant apps in QA, and they take forever, and they run really slowly, but you test that damn slow path a lot. And this turned out to catch all kinds of bugs, really low cost, really easily. We just tell the QA guys, okay, turn on blah, 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 lot flag, and let the damn thing run, you know, giant web server X, and it takes forever, but bugs pop out, and they would be deterministic and easy to find. It was a great answer. Thin locks, another sort of hotspot notion. It, it, the, the no, the, I think the notion was out there beforehand, um, but hotspot sort of made it popular. And that's this idea that we can come up with a single, uh, a single word in the object header that you're going to cast to take a lock. Um, and, and that's the entire weight, the cost of, the majority cost of taking a lock. Turns out if you uh, ran out of time, I'm sorry, I'm going to run out of time. If you, if you ran out of, uh, uh, of the one lock, you had a more complicated locking thing, you could have a forwarding pointer on the, on the slow path through the lock to just hand you off to some other piece of the world to do the thicker lock that you had to do when you had a, a contended lock. Um, even thinner locks, actually, for hotspot are very useful, uh, for Java at least, are very useful. Um, uh, I'm going to skip forward. Okay, so I'm going to do, uh, I'm, I've been told the five minute mark, so I'm going to whip through this section and get to the things I won't ever do again pretty quick. So this was hard, but good to do. Porting to many OSs, even if you only port to an x86, Making it set up so you can port to an ARM, for instance, forces a discipline in the code that's worth it. It breaks out abstractly those things that are dependent on uh, the x86 state of the world and those things that are you know, done another way, that don't actually care what you're looking at. It's all the notion of a virtual machine that you're coding your virtual machine in versus not. There's going to be some hardware-specific piece, but you want to break it out as soon as you can and move to a more abstract world. right? Um, Deopt, uh, there's no time to go into this now, but it was worth it. And this is uh, the technique Hotspot uses to inline non-finals. Uh, that technique removes completely the line in the code where the final got, the non-final got inlined. Uh, and that has big performance gains because those are usually done inside hot loops. And so you want to get that outside of the hot loop. And if you have to load a class later that breaks your code, you can't save point in the loop uh, at correctly <clears throat> at any point because you've moved the inlining code out of the loop. So uh, let me talk about it offline, because I'm going to run out of time here. But it's definitely worth it to get deopt the right way. And what Hotspot used the word deopt for turned out to have been co-opted by the academic literature to mean something fairly different. Um, and so uh, we should have a discussion, not now, about what Hotspot does for uh, deopt. Self-modifying code happens a lot. And so you want to build so much support into your, your VM uh, infrastructure to help you generate and patch code. You're going to patch inline caches a lot. Of course, all the patches have to run in the face of racing Java threads. Who will see any partial patch, including no matter what order you do the actual patch in the, in the you know, data cache, there is no memory model semantics for stuff in the data cache moving to the iCache that you can rely on. And so you'll see partial patches in all directions you have to get right. Of course, on x86, you have variable size instructions you have to patch. You can't patch atomically across cache lines, so you have to arrange your patchable things to not span cache lines, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and help with that, uh, I've always done this high-level assembler notion, which is actually C code, which looks like assembly, and when you execute it, it dumps assembly code into a buffer that you're going to execute later. Um, and then I can run all kind of interesting invariants on the code, um, prove them, you know, debug them, or get support like uh, uh, adding no ops to insert such that a call instruction, which is a one byte call and a four byte offset, doesn't span a cache line in the four bytes, but you can span it on the one byte thing. So there's all kinds of fun games you can play with the high level assembler that are sort of necessary. 64 uh, bit object header, uh, again, very useful um, because you shrink one word out of your object pointer, your heap shrunk by, you know, 5%, uh, your, your decache has got 5% more productive, you ran 5% faster. It's just like that simple. Uh, dense thread IDs was part of making those object headers dense. Uh, after I aligned my stacks on two meg boundaries, a uh, thread ID was simply take the stack pointer and shift it right. That's your thread ID. Very useful. Um, the ability to save point single threads, I talked about it earlier. Um, it's very cheap. Predictive branch, oh, and cache hit. So eight clock cycle every thousand or so. Um, 
Thread does a lot of self-service tasks for which it never has to enter into the, the core VM. It just does it in a little piece of assembly code sitting off to the side and gets back to running code. So these are all things that are typically done in you know, uh, high nanos, low microsecond time ranges, including uh, find all your stack roots or phase flip them all, or check for breakpoints and debug hooks, revoke bias locks, clean inline caches, there's a bunch of stuff. Okay, things I won't do again. And then I'll be out of time and they'll boot me out. Okay, I won't write a VM and see. Um, because mixing pointers in an odd garbage collected language is a freaking total pain. The this pointer in C++ was usually an oop. And so you would accidentally pass it along to some function call that did something slow, got blocked, took a GC cycle, and your this pointer moved out from under you. And of course the C compiler didn't have any idea, so you just choked. Uh, I did uh, Burr's style pattern matching, which is really good, high technology 20 years ago, and now it's like a waste of time. Um, don't actually need it, you know, it's it like VAX, but you don't actually need it on x86, because x86 architecturally is actually fairly regular these days. You know, back then it was really screwball, but now it's pretty regular, although the encoding suck, but the actual, what you can do with an instructions are all pretty regular now. You just generate code, sort of the obvious thing to do. Uh, patch and roll forward save points. I won't talk about why it sucked. It sucked horribly. Do polling. Generic callie save registers. Um, most calling conventions involving lots of uh, registers on the high register count machines, one of you have callie save registers. So a callie save register means that you pass some value that the caller handed you and you just preserved it in your call, generally by spilling it to the stack if you needed it or leaving it in a register if you didn't. That's where the efficiency part comes in. But was it an oop when you spilled it down to the stack? Okay, so you got a oop map. It says, is the callie save register, was that an oop? Well, it depends on what the caller passed you. Did the caller pass you an oop or not? So now you have to call the stack to figure out whether you're looking at an oop or not. And that, in turn, was more trouble than it was worth. Don't pass oops in callie save registers. Um, adapter frames, I'm just going to be out of time. I'm going to skip that one. Constant oops in code looks really good on 32-bit x86 when Hotspot started. 64-bit oops look horrible on both x86 and all other platforms. <laughs> because you have multiple instructions, so patching that constant moving it required you to do a multi-instruction patch, which you can't do atomically. So you had to stop all threads outside of a patched OOP to do it, and it wasn't worth it. Um, just put them in a table, and somewhere a constant table, and then you load a table plus offset and grab it out that way. Um, way the heck, you get an extra load, easy to schedule around in the JIT, um, so there wasn't any actual cost to runtime to do it. Uh, fewer instructions for everybody for the code that generated, and you know the GC can just move the table around. It's easy. Locked headers in the stack um, don't need it. It was a total pain in the butt. Okay, I'm I'm, I'm going to be done here. I'll, I'll leave this one up, and we'll take whatever Q and A time there is before they kick us out. Here's some open questions that I can argue both ways on that I can't say are clearly right or wrong. Um, graph coloring. I know it's faster than a linear scan in ultimate performance at an engineering cost that's interestingly large. Uh, object header, I know I can do it in one word. I won't ever do it again in two, but it's definitely more engineering. You have to screw around. You have to have the thread ID, and you have to have a class ID notion, both of which have interesting engineering costs. Stage zero JIT um, versus interpreter, I actually don't know. I've seen successful systems go both ways. Right? Hotspot only did it with an interpreter, but I've totally seen people do stage zero JIT and get away with it, and it works. Green threads versus OS threads, again, I've seen both ways work well. Um, GC, that one is all about how much effort you want to put into your GC team to make a better, faster collector, or a low pause, or both, or neither, or whatever. 